Well, those of you who were here last week, or at least listening to us online, uh, you will have listened to Rod's wonderful exposition of the first 14 verses of the fifth chapter of John's Gospel. And you will recall that we ended last week on a rather positive note. We saw how it is that, that Jesus went in search of the man he had just healed so that he might reveal himself to him. You see, it wasn't enough, was it, that this man received physical healing? It wasn't enough. Uh, what this man needed was spiritual healing. And when you read this story as it's meant to be read, you realise that it is in fact spiritual healing that this man's physical healing points to. This man's physical healing, in other words, is a sign. It's, it's a proof of, of Jesus' authority to bring a, a far greater and a more permanent healing. You see, Jesus may have fixed this man's physical brokenness, but it's this man's spiritual brokenness that Jesus now draws our attention to. And so what does Jesus do? Well, Jesus seeks him out. This man needed to know, the one in whom the power to heal is invested. And up until this point in time, he, he didn't know who that was, did he? And so Jesus searches for him and he finds him. And we were reminded by Rod as he led us through this story that it is, in fact, Jesus who searches for us and not the other way around. It is, I think, unfortunate that the great majority of our, our songs of praise highlight our searching for God when, in fact, the Bible makes it abundantly clear that the only reason any of us stand before a holy God, clean and forgiven, is because he sought us out. He found us. He brought us to himself. When the one leaves the 99, he doesn't himself seek to rediscover what he lost. No, no. The shepherd leaves the 99, doesn't he? And he seeks out the one. He seeks him out and he finds him and he brings him back. You see, that church is our God. That is what our God does. And not only does he, he find him and he bring him back, he does so at great personal cost. We may think that we've searched for God and found him when in reality he's searched for us. He's found us and he's brought us back to himself. It reminds me of when I used to play hide and seek with my children. My children won't remember this, but, uh, but I do. When they were very young, I, I would hide myself in places where I could be easily found and upon finding me they would often squeal with delight I found you or, or or words to that effect of course had I been really intent on hiding myself they would have never found me would they and the same is true of our God God hides himself church in plain sight so that if and when we find him it's because he wants to be found such is God's love for those who are lost. And so before we continue to bring ourselves before this God who seeks us out, who, who finds us and brings us back to himself, let's pray. Uh, Father God, we do thank you that you are the searching God. You are the one who seeks us out. We don't go searching for you. We thank you, Lord, that when you find us, you pull us out of the muck and the mire. You bring us out of the darkness and into your light. We thank you that though we were once lost, now we are found. My prayer this morning, Lord, is that you might continue to seek and to find those who are lost, that you would use us, your servants, to help you in that task, and that we might have great joy in finding people, perhaps family members, friends, neighbours, work colleagues, people in the street, those who are lost, that we would too seek them out and find them and bring them to you. So speak to us clearly this morning from your word. Give us ears to hear, soften our hearts that we might receive your word. For we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, later Jesus found him at the temple and said to him, See, you are well again. Stop sinning 
or something worse may happen to you. Now, a great many of the uh, conversations that I had with my parents when I was growing up, I, I can't remember. I, I cannot recall a great many of them at all. And it's not that I wasn't interested in what they had to say, although there, there were times, I've, I've got to say, that I clearly wasn't interested. Such was my rebellious nature. It was more that there were so many competing voices, particularly my own. I think we understand a great deal more today about competing voices, don't we? We hear the voice of the age or the herald. We listen to the talking heads on Fox and Sky. We hear the great many other voices shouting for our attention on social media every, every morning and every afternoon and, and every evening. We hear the voice of our own conscience, perhaps, if that is, it hasn't already been drowned out. Our conscience, you see, is one of the first voices that the world teaches us to ignore. We also hear the voice of Hollywood and the voice of government, and maybe if we've factored it into our, our daily schedule, we might hear the voice of God as he speaks to us from his word. The more time we spend in God's word, the more likely we are to hear his voice. Now, when I was a young man, God's word didn't have a place at all in my life. And so the voices I listened to were predominantly threefold. My own my friends and my parents, and usually in that order. A great many of the conversations have now long since faded from my memory. There, there are, however, a couple of conversations that are still vivid and which leave a lasting impression. One such conversation is a conversation I had with my father, and it, I think it's going to stay with me forever. Such was its impact upon me. And it was a conversation that really did pull me up. It stopped me in my tracks. It was an uncomfortable conversation. And it was a conversation that cut me to the core. It was perhaps the most loving thing that my father ever said to me. And it was a conversation that I had to have. I didn't want to have it, but I had to have it. And as I listened to the conversation that Jesus has with the man in this story... It's the kind of conversation that will also leave a lasting impression. And so Jesus seeks this man out and he finds him. And, and then Jesus says to him something that at first glance might seem a little bit strange. It'll certainly seem a little bit strange to us. Stop sinning. <laughs> Stop sinning, says Jesus, or something worse may happen to you. And so the first thing that Jesus does is, is point out to this man that sinning often has consequences. Now, he doesn't say that the reason this man was lame was due to sin, although it may well be the fact that it was the reason. And the truth is that a, that a great many infirmities are clearly not the result of sin. Sometimes sickness and misfortune are simply a part of life. And I'd go so far as to say perhaps most sickness and misfortune. It is one of the unfortunate consequences, isn't it, that comes with living in a fallen world. In a fallen world, we all know, don't we, that weeds grow alongside fruit trees. Pain walks beside joy. Wholeness and brokenness stand side by side. Sickness and misfortune are a part of what it means to live in a fallen world. Now, it may just be that as you sit and listen to me this morning, that you find yourself in just such a position. That you remain faithful is a demonstration of God's grace. You see, he holds us, doesn't he, even when we are broken. He doesn't let us go in our infirmity. He, he, he doesn't discard us. That's what we do. When things break, what do we do? We often discard them. And when we are frustrated, perhaps, or even angry that, that he hasn't healed us now, now, when, when we want it so badly, and he continues even in our frustration with him and our anger at him to hold us. You see, that church, that's a sign of God's grace. 
There are times, however, when the problems we face are the result of sin. Doing that which God forbids us to do. Behaving in such a way that is contrary to the revealed will of God. And Jesus makes it abundantly clear that the man he has just revealed himself to, what does he need to do? Well, he needs to stop sinning or else something worse may happen. Now, I cannot remember, church, the last time I heard from the pulpit that sinfulness leads to consequences. And yet that is precisely what Jesus here does, isn't it? What Jesus doesn't do is tie his physical infirmity to sin, nor does he heap guilt upon him. That, in fact, is what Jesus doesn't do. He, he wants to free this man of his guilt. He wants to ensure that guilt no longer has an opportunity to hold him back. He wants to ensure that it no longer has an opportunity to, to cause him shame. And so what we learn is that there is nothing wrong with pointing out a person's sin where sin exists. It's what my dad lovingly and courageously pointed out to me all those years ago. That, after all, is the only way a person can be, can be free of guilt and shame. By allowing Jesus to address it, by confronting it, rather than excusing it, rather than ignoring it, or worse still, rejoicing in it, the way that the West now rejoices in sexual sin. And having confronted it, we are to run to the only person who has the power to deal with it to to overcome it and so jesus doesn't burden him with guilt he cannot carry what jesus also doesn't do is is tell us does he what could be worse stop sinning says jesus or something worse may happen to you that's what jesus says now the question really does need to be asked what could possibly be worse church than being lame for 38 years. What could possibly be worse than that? Well, if you allow the text to tell you what it is that Jesus has in mind, then the answer becomes obvious, doesn't it? As bad and as tragic as physical infirmity can be, and, and often is, physical infirmity is never a good thing, it pales into insignificance, church, to what awaits everyone who ignores the salvation that Jesus offers. To not give up one sin, says Jesus, leads to something worse. It leads to judgment. Now again, judgment is not something that is readily preached anymore from a great many pulpits, is it? And yet Jesus, he speaks about it all the time. And the reason he speaks about it all the time is because he really does want people to hear it. He wants people to understand just how serious it is. You do not want to be judged, says Jesus, by the living God. That, in effect is what Jesus is here saying. In other words, whatever else happens to you, avoid the judgment that is coming upon the world. And almost everything else that Jesus talks about in this, in this section, it highlights that one point. And in verses 28 to 29, he summarises it. He says, Do not be amazed at this, for a time is coming when all who are in their graves will hear his voice and come out. Those who have done what is good will rise to live. And those who have done what is evil will rise to be condemned. What could be worse than 38 years of physical infirmity? Standing before the living God and being condemned. That, church, is worse. Whatever else you do, says Jesus, avoid God's judgment. Now, the only way you can, can trivialise what Jesus is here saying is to dismiss him. Ignore completely what it is that Jesus has just said. And in verses 15 to 18, we see that that is precisely what the Jewish leaders did. The man went away and told the Jewish leaders that it was Jesus who had made him well. So, because Jesus was doing these things on the Sabbath... 
the Jewish leaders began to persecute him. In his defence, Jesus said to them, My father is always at his work to this very day, and I too am working. For this reason, they tried all the more to kill him. Not only was he breaking the Sabbath, but he was even calling God his own father, making himself equal with God. Now, there are a, uh, a number of responses that we could consider as we read these four verses. We could start by considering the man's response. He went to the Jewish leaders. That was his response. Now, was that a good thing? Was he interested in giving glory to Jesus or was he afraid of, of what the Jewish leaders would do to him? Well, John doesn't say. And perhaps John's prompting us to ask ourselves the question, how would I respond? What would I do if I was put on the spot? Or we could stop to consider John's statement when speaking of Jesus' response in his defence. When Jesus is accused, what does he do? Well, he defends. That's what he does. When you are accused... And when I am accused, as one day we will be, who is going to defend us? Who is going to defend you? Jesus, you see, he defends. And the Father listens to him. And, and so we have the man's response, we have Jesus' response, and we have the response of the Jewish leaders. Well, they simply weren't interested in anything Jesus said. They, they blocked their ears, didn't they? They really didn't have time to listen to him. They had already made up their minds. And having made up their minds, the only thing left for them to do was to remove him. It is, of course, what a great many people do with Jesus today. Rather than listen to him, a great many men and women, they simply remove him, don't they? They remove him from their thoughts. And unlike the Jewish leaders who, who planned to physically remove Jesus, men and women today, they don't have to remove him physically. All they have to do is to remove him from their minds. And to be fair, it's something that most of us ourselves at one time did, isn't it? Unless we grew up in the church, we didn't want to listen to him. And even if we, if we did grow up in the church, many people, particularly young people I might, Add, leave the church sometimes because the church has grown cold that is true and it's something that we need to be always aware of or sometimes it's because the message that they hear from the pulpit is boring or it's bland or sometimes it's because the message they hear and the message they see is is no different than the message they hear and the message they see in the world why come to church when I can hear what is being said in the church, in the world. But sometimes young people leave the church because they just don't want to listen to Jesus. His words are far too confronting. And so rather than listen to him, we'll just block our ears or, or better still, we'll remove his voice altogether. We'll go somewhere his voice can't be heard. Well, it's just as well church that Jesus seeks us out isn't it he leaves the 99 to go and seek out the one it's why I'm saved and no doubt it's why you're saved too and so the Jewish leaders didn't want to listen to anything that Jesus had to say and so what exactly did Jesus say well what Jesus said was that he is equal with God that's what Jesus said there are essentially two reasons, writes John, that the Jewish leaders wanted to kill Jesus. The first reason was because he was a lawbreaker. He broke the Sabbath. He worked on Saturday. Actually, Jesus didn't break the Sabbath, did he? He broke the law of the Pharisees. He, he broke their law. That's what Jesus broke. The Pharisees made the Sabbath something that God never intended for it to be. And so rather than keep God's law, what did the religious leaders do? Well, they defined it. And Jesus broke their definition, and so that's the first reason they wanted to kill him. 
And just on that point, Rod mentioned last week that Jesus didn't heal the man who was lame just to start a controversy. And of course, that's true. Absolutely. But I think, and I could be wrong, I think it's only partly true. You see, Jesus could have found this man on any day of the week. And yet, what did he do? He chose the Sabbath. Why did he choose the Sabbath? Well, John doesn't tell us, so I guess it's not really all that important. But I think, for what it's worth, I think Jesus chose the Sabbath because he knew it would cause a stink. Jesus knew that it would upset people. It would reveal just how blind these blind guides really were. You see, when Jesus, when tradition usurps love in the form of such a miraculous healing, Jesus shows us just how blind spiritual blindness can be. And so that's the first reason the religious leaders were upset and wanted to airbrush Jesus out of the picture. The second reason they wanted to kill him was because he claimed equality with God. He was even calling God his own father, making himself equal with God. That's what John writes. Now, in fairness, that is something that they got right, isn't it? Not even Jesus claimed to be just a man. The claim that Jesus and God were the same, they, they were the one, well, it came from Jesus' own lips. And that's a really big claim. And it's a claim that directly led church to his crucifixion. And it is, isn't it interesting that, that a man with such intelligence, a man who could, could out-debate the finest minds in Israel, he wasn't able to see it coming. But of course, Jesus did see it coming, didn't he? It's the reason why he was so provocative. So that far from being afraid of dying, he, he embraced it. It is, in fact, what he came here to do. It is the basis upon which the man he searched for and found might himself avoid the judgment that is to come. You don't have to experience God's judgment. Why not? Because I've come to experience it for you. That's what Jesus says. Place your faith in me because I'm going to take your place in judgment. See, Jesus wasn't afraid of being provocative, was he? Because he, he knew exactly what it was that was coming. He knew what was coming and he embraced it as painful and as terrifying as it was. Jesus continued to walk towards his own crucifixion. And it is, of course, something that none of us can fully comprehend. None of us, not really, can, can fully appreciate just how astonishing is the love of God for a people who would rather see him nailed to a Roman cross than listen to his voice. Very truly I tell you, begins Jesus in verse 19, the son can do nothing by himself. He can only do what he sees his father doing because whatever the father does, the son also does. For the Father loves the Son and shows him all he does. Yes, and he will show him even greater works than these so that you will be amazed. For just as the Father raises the dead and gives them life, even so the Son gives life to whom he is pleased to give it. Jesus works on the Sabbath because his Father works on the Sabbath. Jesus does no more than his Father does. It really is an extraordinary claim, isn't it? But it is a claim that one needs to take seriously. What is most extraordinary is what Jesus says next. Yes, the Father works on the Sabbath and I also work on the Sabbath. And not only that, just as the Father raises the dead, so also I have been given authority to do what? Oh, to raise the dead. I give life, says Jesus. And what's more, I'm pleased to give it. I don't sell it. I don't give it begrudgingly. I don't give it because I have to give it. I'm pleased to give it. Just as the Father raises the dead and gives them life, I too, says Jesus, give life. And the reason I give it is because it's mine to give. And so what is it, church, that gives Jesus pleasure? It's a good question, isn't it? What is it, do you think, that gives Jesus pleasure? What gives him pleasure, church, 
is to give you life. It pleases him. It gives him great joy. The very thing that demands his death is also the thing that gives him the most pleasure. It's not that Jesus looks forward to the pain. It's, it's not even that Jesus particularly wants to die. One needs only to reflect upon the scene of Jesus kneeling in the garden to see how much anguish the thought of his crucifixion, the thought of his separation from his father causes him. What gives Jesus pleasure, however, is knowing that his death will open up the door for your life. That's what pleases him. That church is what brings Jesus great joy. In his book, Written in Blood, uh, Robert Coleman tells the story of a little boy whose sister needed a blood transfusion. And the doctor uh, explained to this young boy, writes Robert Coleman, that his sister had the same disease that he himself had recovered from only a couple years earlier. And her only chance for recovery was to receive a transfusion from someone who had previously overcome the disease. And since the uh, two children had the same rare blood type, uh, the boy was the ideal donor. And so the doctor knelt down uh, beside this uh, young boy and he, he asked him, would you give your blood to Mary? And the young boy hesitated for a moment and his, his lower lip began to tremble. And then he smiled and said, yes, sure, I'll do it for my sister. Not long after that, the two children, they were wheeled into the, uh, the hospital room. Uh, Mary, the young girl, she was pale and, and very thin. And her brother, Johnny, he was rather healthy, very robust young fellow. Neither of them spoke to each other. But when their eyes met, young Johnny grinned. He smiled at her. Why did he smile at her? He smiled at her because he loved her. And he understood that by giving to her his blood, she was going to get better. He understood that she was going to live. And as the nurse inserted the needle into his arm, uh, Johnny's smile began to fade. He watched his blood flow through the tube from his arm into hers. And when the ordeal was almost over, his, his voice slightly shaky, it broke the silence. And he said to the doctor, Doctor, when do I die? Only then did the doctor realise why the young boy had hesitated, why his lip had trembled when he had agreed to donate his blood. He thought that by giving his blood to his sister, it meant that he would have to give up his own life. And so in that brief moment, he made a great decision, didn't he? Of course, we know that Johnny didn't have to die to save his sister. Each of us, however, we have a condition far more serious than Mary's and it does require Jesus to give not just his blood but his life and Jesus did it and he didn't do it begrudgingly he didn't do it with any sense of hesitation it pleased him it pleased him to die so that we might live very truly I tell you, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life and will not be judged, but has crossed over from death to life. Very truly I tell you, a time is coming and has now come when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God and those who hear will live. And so Jesus shifts his focus somewhat, doesn't he? Did you notice that? He shifts his focus from the man he healed to whoever. There it is again. Did you, did you hear it? Did you see it? That wonderful word that John loves to use, the word whoever. And it is, I think, one of the most glorious words in all of Scripture. And it, and it, and it comes from the lips of Jesus himself. Whoever. No one, church, is excluded. If you fall into that category, then you too can be saved. It really is good news, isn't it? And Jesus concludes by reminding everyone, whoever, that's what he says, whoever will listen, whoever will come to him, 
Whoever has ears to hear and eyes to see, Jesus reminds everyone that God has given to him all authority. Authority to give life and authority to judge. Listen to him. As the Father has life in himself, so he has granted the Son also to have life in himself. And he has given him authority to judge because he is the Son of Man. Do not be amazed at this. For a time is coming when all who are in their graves will hear his voice and come out. Those who have done what is good will rise to live. And those who have done what is evil will rise to be condemned. You can't miss it, can you? Did you hear him? Jesus gives life and church. Jesus judges. He dispenses justice, in other words. And the fact that Jesus dispenses justice, well, that also is good news, isn't it? Why? Well, because the world is full of injustice. Think about it for a moment. The millions killed by Hitler and Stalin and every other despot, and they were denied justice. It seems they got away with murder, doesn't it? The drunk driver who takes the life of the young mother and her kids, what does he get for it? Seven or eight years. Where's the justice? The burglar who who breaks into your house and is never caught. The lie that you got away with. The lie that I got away with. The man and the woman who is falsely tried and who is convicted. Those who sit on death row. Innocent. Injustice, it seems, is everywhere. But God sees it all. And what we are reassured of here, church, is that justice will be dispensed. It really is good news. Justice, writes John, is coming, ready or not. And you can take your chances with God's justice. You can do that. We can all do that. We can trust that our own goodness will be enough for the judge to declare us innocent of all charges. We can do that. And Jesus says that if you've done good, you will live. Or you can give up hoping that your own goodness will justify you and you can turn to Jesus and trust in his goodness. You see, goodness will triumph. But whose goodness? Your goodness? My goodness? Are you willing to bet your eternity on your own goodness? Or will you exchange your own goodness and put your trust in his? His goodness, church, really is our good news.